On October 11, 1973, 42-year-old Charles Hickson and 19-year-old Calvin Parker experienced an event in Pascagoula, Mississippi that changed their lives forever. While fishing along the Pascagoula River, they saw pale blue lights emanating from a large oval-shaped craft. A mysterious door slid open, and the robotic-like beings that emerged from the craft and the strange events that followed presents us with one of the most peculiar abduction cases in history. Yet, it is considered by many, including Dr. J. Allen Hynek of Project Blue Book, to be one of the most credible close encounter stories. So, what makes it so bizarre? And what makes it so believable? Well, dear people, welcome back to Paranormal Community College. My name is Riley, and today we're talking about the Pascagoula abduction. But before we do, if you'd like to support the show, make sure you follow or subscribe, and please feel free to leave a review. I've also, I just want to let you guys know, I've appreciated all the feedback and encouragement and support I've received so far, and I can't tell you how much it means to me. It's always a bit scary starting something new, so I am just so thankful for y'all listening. I also gotta say, I got the coolest birthday gifts last week, so... I had made this silly little reel on Instagram about Skinwalker Ranch and Robert Bigelow's wife messaged me on Instagram and ended up posting it to the official Skinwalker Ranch Instagram story. And so I was super excited about that. Coolest birthday present ever. And then I had uh, also posted a memory from four years ago about how I was at Alien Con in LA and got to take a pic with uh, David Childress from Ancient Aliens. And he ended up reposting it too. So for my birthday, I was like in alien nerd heaven. But anyway, let's talk about some aliens down to buy ya. So, as mentioned, the main characters today are Charles Hickson, 42, and Calvin Parker, 19. And to give you guys some background, Calvin Parker had known Charles Hickson since he was a young kid. Charles Hickson was friends with Calvin's father, and growing up, they would all go on family fishing trips together. Calvin recalls one year that he tripped and fell into a dangerous part of the Pearl River, and if it wasn't for Charlie's swift rescue, he may have drowned. Charlie, after all, was a veteran of the Korean War, and he was protective of young Calvin as much as he was his own children. And Calvin always looked up to Charlie, seeing him as the hardworking family man he hoped to be one day. Living in different small towns in southern Mississippi, both men came from working-class backgrounds. Calvin dropped out of high school his junior year, not uncommon for working-class southerners at the time. All Calvin wanted was a job that allowed him to have a family and gave him enough of a pension that he could spend his retirement doing what he loved most, fishing. Charles worked various manual labor jobs throughout his life, eventually ending up at F.B. Walker's shipyard in Pascagoula. At the time, Calvin was working as a welder at Wansley Machine and Welding. Engaged to a woman named Waynette, who he is still with today, Calvin needed a better job. He was on call 24 hours a day with Wansley Machine and Welding, and he wanted to be able to spend more time with his soon-to-be wife. So Charlie got him a job at F.B. Walker Shipyard in Pascagoula, along with a room for rent in his home for $50 a week. He began working at the shipyard the first week of October of 1973, barely a week before their incredible encounter. Now remember, these guys are living in the Bible Belt of the Deep South. These are men who just want the simple life. They work hard to provide for their loved ones. They were raised to be good Christian boys. They don't go around talking about aliens or UFOs. That is until the events that transpired on October 11th, 1973. It was a Thursday and abnormally hot for that time of year. After a long day of sweating in the sultry southern heat, Charles asked Calvin if he'd like to go fishing when they get off work. At first, Calvin didn't feel like going because there were too many bugs out, and besides, he didn't have any of his gear with him since the move. Charles assures him that he knows a really good spot and that he's got plenty of fishing rods and tackle for Calvin to borrow at the house. So. Calvin eventually agrees to go fishing. So it's five o'clock, the two had just clocked off. They stop by the house to get some fishing gear and tell Charlie's wife Blanche they'd be back in a couple of hours. The spot Charlie shows Calvin is just off Highway 90 on the Pascagoula River. He explained to Calvin that it was where they unloaded grain from the ships and that sometimes that grain would fall into the river and the fish would go crazy. By the time they got settled, it was just after 6 p.m. They parked Calvin's brand new 1973 yellow Rambler Hornet a couple hundred feet from where they set up to fish, an old steel pier along the east bank. The moon was full and there was a nice cool fall breeze relieving the men from their hot day at work. A seemingly perfect night to take a load off and do some fishing. And it should be mentioned early on too that Calvin didn't drink at all and Charlie only rarely did, so it's not like they were slinging back beers on this night. The following is an excerpt from Calvin Parker's book, Pascagoula, The Closest Encounter. 
I just happened to turn around and look back seeing some blue hazy lights and thinking the police were looking at my car. At about that point, Charlie also saw the lights, almost I reckon at the same time as I had. I thought the police were going to make us move or maybe they thought we were dumping some trash. Looking back now, I wish that was true. Then all of a sudden, we both saw it at about the same time. It was an oval shaped craft about eight feet high and fairly long in the shape of a football. It was hovering about two feet from the ground and I didn't see any support under the craft. It looked to be just floating. It was hard to tell the color because of the lights that were hazy blue and quite bright. Then all of a sudden, the craft just lit up really bright. That was when the door opened, allowing light from the inside to spill out. Calvin recalls that he looked over at Charlie who seemed pale and just frozen, staring at this thing. Both were frozen in fear and bewilderment. Calvin thought about running, but there was no time. It was too late. Before they knew it, three strange beings emerged from the craft, floating a foot or two off the ground. Calvin describes them as three gray colored wrinkled skin creatures, shortish in size at about five feet tall, more or less, stocky looking gray in color and with no facial features. Even stranger, Calvin and Charlie both describe these entities as having pincher like hands that they grabbed them with. They also said they had two legs, but that they looked like they were fused together. If you want a visual, I have several artist renditions of these creatures on TikTok and Instagram. Two of these creatures grabbed Charlie and one grabbed Calvin. They both claimed they were stuck in the arm with something. Calvin called it a quote, go to hell shot. And then they were completely paralyzed, floating alongside these creatures into this mysterious craft, unable to escape, unable to scream, unable to fight them off. Once in the craft, Charlie and Calvin were separated. Their stories are almost identical, but some details are slightly different. Charlie remembers being worried about what these beings were doing to young Calvin, just 19 at the time. Calvin claims that he was floated onto a table. He saw the table as he entered the room, but upon laying down on it, he couldn't feel a surface. Charlie claims that there was no table in his experience and that he was just suspended there at about a 45 degree angle. Next, Calvin claims this little blue square box about the size and shape of a deck of cards with a silver bottom came out of the wall and started scanning his body from head to toe. In Charlie's version of events, he describes the scanning device as a large eye, not a square box. Calvin describes the next part of his experience saying, quote, a smaller looking being that somehow made me feel safe came into the room. It had a small, thin face and was about five feet tall with big brown eyes, light gray in color. He describes this being as seeming more human-like and that it communicated with him telepathically, telling him, don't be afraid. He then says that another device came out of the wall and started scanning him again. Then, Calvin remembers that the beings he calls the big ugly ones came back into the room and floated him out of the ship and back to where the two had been fishing. He could hear Charlie calling his name, Calvin, Calvin, are you okay? But Calvin was still feeling paralyzed and he couldn't put his arms down. Eventually, he came to and was able to move again. Calvin says, As I turned around, I looked up, hearing what I call a zipping noise. It was like the sound of a strong wind blowing, and it was really quite loud. Then the craft just went straight up and disappeared out of sight. Upon walking back to the car together, they noticed that the passenger window was damaged. Calvin said the type of glass wasn't supposed to be able to shatter, but that it shattered completely as soon as they opened the door. Calvin starts the car, but his brand new car is having trouble starting. Calvin thought to himself, quote, I lost my car and now my job because I knew I wasn't going to stay on the coast after this. Now I'm going to backtrack a little bit to share Charlie's side of the abduction in his book, UFO Contact at Pascagoula. In describing the three beings, Charlie says, quote, the head seemed to come directly to the shoulders, no neck, and something resembling a nose came out to a point about two inches long. On each side of the head, about where the ears would be, was something similar to the nose. Directly under the nose was a slit resembling a mouth. The arms were something like human arms, but long in proportion to the body. The hands resembled a mitten, and there was a thumb attached. The legs remained together, and the feet looked something like elephant's feet. The entire body was wrinkled and had grayish color. There could have been eyes, but the area above the nose was so wrinkled that I couldn't tell. As far as that scanning device or whatever it may have been, Charlie writes, quote, their eye came closer and stopped about six inches from my face. The end focused on me was different color or type of material than the rest of it. I tried again to close my eyes, 
but some force kept them open. The eye lingered there for a while, then started to move down my body and returned to move over down my entire body. No pain, no sensation. I remember trying to wiggle my toes, but no way. Why in hell don't they just stop me from breathing and let my life end here, he says. He goes on to say that he felt like he was talking, but he couldn't hear his voice. He was trying to say, where's Calvin? And please don't take me away. He thought about his time in North Korea during the war and told himself to keep calm, that maybe this wasn't his day to die, just like all the times he thought he was going to die in Korea. After Charlie was floated back to the riverbank, he said that he had never seen more terror on Calvin's face than on anyone else's. Charlie said he started to crawl towards Calvin because his legs still felt a little numb. He also recalled that zipping noise as the craft flew away, but claims a message raced across his mind. We are peaceful, we meant you no harm. He said he began to shake Calvin, and when he finally came to and was able to move, he said that it took Calvin a little while to remember who he was. He likened it to seeing the face of shock he'd seen in men in Korea. So the two get in Calvin's car, and after it finally starts, Charlie says he wants to go to town. One, to check what time it was, and two, to grab a drink or two. Calvin didn't drink, and Charlie rarely did, but the situation kind of called for it. Okay, so before we move on, let's talk about this crazy encounter for a second. I first came across this story years ago, and I had just read, I think, one little article about it. The article mentioned nothing about their police interview, their interview with Dr. J. Allen Hynek, or Dr. Harder, who we will get to in a little bit. The article also didn't mention anything about their interview with Keesler Air Force Base or the other eyewitness accounts that came over out over the years and that are documented with the Pentagon. So I read this kind of wackadoodle story about two dudes in the swamp seeing aliens and thought it was pretty bogus. I mean, it's just too weird. If you're Cajun or you live in Cajun country, I mean, it sounds like a sci-fi version of a Boudreaux and Thibodeau joke. The beings they describe, to my knowledge, have never been described in any other Close Encounter story. The scanning devices they describe are also almost too science fiction and strange. The whole encounter, quite frankly, is just weird as hell. But the more I dug into this case for this episode, I'll be damned if I'm not pretty convinced that something happened to these two men and that they believe in it themselves wholeheartedly. They are telling the truth as they know it. But let's get back to the car ride into town. In the car, Calvin asked Charlie, Charlie, it seemed as if I died and came back to life. Are you sure we are okay? Charlie assures him that it's over and they are okay. And at first he tells Calvin, we cannot tell anyone about this and we better just try to forget about it. Calvin said, I might not tell anyone, but I won't ever forget it. Did they do anything to you, Charlie? Charlie replies with, I don't think so. What about you? I don't know, replied Calvin, but I do know they almost scared me to death. I'm not sure I'm alive now. The face, Charlie. I couldn't see any eyes. How can anything see you without eyes? Well, somewhere along the journey into town, Charlie decided that they needed to tell someone. What if more people were in danger? Shouldn't the military or the government know? They reach a payphone and Charlie calls Keesler Air Force Base in nearby Biloxi. Charlie says he calmed himself down and told the woman who answered the phone what had happened. However, he was told that the military no longer investigates UFOs, that Project Blue Book has been disbanded, and that they would need to report it to the local authorities. What the hell are we going to do now, Charlie? asked Calvin. Those people at the sheriff's department might think we're crazy. But after Charlie had a couple drinks to calm his nerves, they decided to phone the sheriff's office. Amused, Sheriff Fred Diamond tells them to come on down and they can talk about it. So at the station, the two are interviewed separately, and as you can imagine, the police think that they are just batshit insane. They wonder if they're drunk or on something, but they don't appear to be. They appear to be very shaken up and frantic and even panicky. They bring them into a room together to ask them some more questions, and then they leave the tape recorder in a desk drawer without Charlie or Calvin knowing they're being recorded. The police want to see if they can maybe catch them lying or conspiring together if they leave them alone. However, what plays back to them is convincing. The two seem genuinely afraid. They talk a little about what had happened to them. They pray. Calvin is on the brink of tears or a nervous breakdown, it seems. And so I'm going to post the entire transcript on my Instagram and I'll post it in the Facebook group too as well, rather than me try to play Charlie and Calvin um, in this script. But yeah, some highlights. Um, They talk again and again, like you can't, you hear about these things, but you can't believe that it would ever happen to you. 
They're like, why did this happen to us? Do you think it's the United States? Do you think it was a military craft? Like, was it from the Air Force? And Charlie is like, no, no way it couldn't have been. Um, Calvin just keeps saying over and over again how like he feels like he just died and came back to life, that he felt like he just nearly died. Um, Calvin keeps talking about how much he needs to go home. He wants to go home. He needs like some nerve pills. And he's already worried about, you know, how am I going to sleep tonight? Um, Charlie eventually leaves the room to go flag down the cops because he's like, you know, we want to we want to leave. We want to get out of here. And so while, while Calvin's left alone in the room, he's just like sitting there crying and like praying to God, asking him, like, why? Why did this have to happen to me? And Charlie also says he's like, since he's a veteran, he's like, after all I've had to been through in this world, after all the hell I've been through, why did something like this have to have, have to happen to me? So this secret tape recording is considered to be strong evidence that the two men weren't lying. Within the next week or so, the two did take polygraph tests and both passed, which is also at least strong evidence that they believe wholeheartedly that this happened exactly as they say. Obviously, lie detector tests are so not perfect, but I think they can be somewhat credible in determining whether or not someone believes themselves or not. Sheriff Fred Diamond, who thought they were crazy or on something at first, grew convinced something had happened to them after he heard that tape. As crazy as it sounds, he says he had no choice but to believe them. They just seem so genuine. The two finally get home, neither get any sleep. Crazy Calvin even washes himself with bleach, of all things. In the days following, Calvin also worried that perhaps they had been exposed to radiation and that they may make others sick as well. Thankfully, they tested negative for radiation at Keesler Air Force Base later on. They were also interviewed by authorities at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, and the transcript is basically the same as their police interview. If you want to read that, all, all of it is in Calvin Parker's book, Pascagoula, The Closest Encounter. And what's really cool about his book is a huge chunk of it is just primary sources. So interview after interview, transcripts, newspaper clippings, and the like, which I think is really great, especially being able to see the military and police documentation for this case. Before they left the sheriff's station, Charlie made Sheriff Diamond promise that they wouldn't tell any news people about this, and Sheriff Diamond agreed. Calvin and Charlie thought maybe they had gotten it off their chest, it may be hard to sleep for a while, and they're gonna have to deal with this the rest of their lives most likely, but maybe, maybe they could try to forget it ever happened. Well, that of course didn't happen because the story leaked and became such a sensation that we're still talking about it today in 2023. By the time the two get to work the next day, their shipyard is already swarming with press. Sheriff Diamond swears that he didn't tell anybody, but as he also said, stories like this come out one way or another. Dr. James Harder, a University of California professor and APRO investigator, APRO being the acronym for Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, and Dr. J. Allen Hynek from the defunct Project Blue Book, arrived within 36 hours to interview the two men. This was poor Calvin's literal worst nightmare. This young guy was barely hanging on by a thread as it was. The last thing he wanted was his coworkers, his manager, his friends and family to know about this. The father of his fiance began to question if Calvin was the right man for his daughter. In the years following the encounter, Calvin moved from city to city, job to job, but the press would still find him one way or another. He did eventually marry Waynette and they had children together, but the stress from the Pascagoula encounter contributed to their divorce. They did, however, remarry years later, and Waynette was actually key in convincing Calvin to share his story. But for years, decades even, Calvin struggled, suffering from a nervous breakdown shortly after the event. Charlie, on the other hand, seemed to kind of ease into the attention. Seemingly angry at first, he soon was making television appearances, in the years that followed all the way up until his death in 2011, Charlie was making appearances at UFO seminars and wrote his own book. This bothered Calvin considerably at first. He even wondered if it was Charlie who leaked the story in the first place. But we got some more stuff to talk about back in 1973. So we're gonna talk about their hypnotic regression for a little bit and then we're gonna return to it a bit later. Now I'm gonna get on my soapbox for a second. I'm not a big fan of hypnotic regression. 
I just think people really underestimate the capacities of the human imagination and what kind of images our brains are capable of creating. I think there is truth that comes out in these regressions sometimes, but that you really can't trust it or claim that it is any proof at all that someone really experienced that exact thing in the exact way they described it during a regression. That's the main problem I have with, say, the Betty and Barney Hill abduction. So many of the details only came out after they were regressed, at least to my knowledge. I still have a lot of research and reading to do for that upcoming episode. But I mean, Barney's regression tape is pretty convincing that something terrified happened to them. What I like about this case though with Charlie and Calvin is that in their two initial regression sessions, they tell their story almost exactly as they told it to the police station. It didn't change drastically. The aliens didn't give them some secret message about our planet or climate or the meaning of the universe or like some people claim. In fact, especially with Calvin, Dr. Harder had to pull him out of it because he was too afraid and didn't want to push Calvin over the edge because he was already struggling with his experience. Charlie too would become terrified. Now, as a side note, Charlie would undergo further hypnotic regression sessions throughout the years, but they did seem kind of bogus and they were supposed to be about other encounters he had had with aliens after the 1973 abduction. He would either say like he couldn't remember anything or would appear to be making things up. So that does unfortunately kind of take away from some of the credibility of this story, but um, their initial regressions are strong and believable, I think. I think the only thing they add is that there was something on top of the craft, but they couldn't see what it was. And I think that was pretty much it. Anything else that was different was very benign. Both Dr. Hynek and Dr. Harder recognized that they were traumatized and that hypnosis must progress slowly, but stated to the press that they were not imbalanced people and that they were not, quote, crackpots. Dr. Harder added, quote, there was definitely something here that was not terrestrial of the earth. So anyway, this story is printed far and wide throughout the United States, from coast to coast. It was a sensation for the growing UFO community throughout the United States, but people in their small Mississippi community ridiculed them, and as they both had predicted, they thought Calvin and Charlie were crazy. Or they were overly curious. Calvin said he couldn't go to the store without being harassed with questions, even back at his hometown in Laurel a couple hours away. This attention caused him to suffer a nervous breakdown shortly before his wedding day, which occurred on November 9th, 1973, barely a month after the abduction. He was taken to the hospital, he was shaking uncontrollably, and his blood pressure was dangerously high, his heart beating at 160 beats per minute. The doctor prescribed him medication for his stress, which he stubbornly threw away in the trash because he doesn't take drugs or want people to think he takes drugs. Calvin says that Waynette was very supportive throughout the post-abduction period and that just sitting down and talking with her really helped his stress. But perhaps Calvin could have been able to bear it more easily if he had known how many other witnesses there were. No one else saw them get abducted, but others in the area reported a similar craft to authorities or have come out later on with their own story. A World War II veteran by the name of Larry Booth was interviewed in 1974 and described what he saw on that Thursday night, October 11th, 1973. Here it is in his own words. I just happened to glance out the front door through this long glass window at the top of the door. That's when I saw this big object, which I'd say about five to eight feet above the telephone pole out there, above the street light. The object was standing still. It wasn't moving at all when I saw it but all the lights around the outside of it were turning clockwise motion and they were all red, no green, no other colors, all red, but no wings or offset, no outer shape or nothing, just a huge object. So I started back to call my wife just about the time I went to move. Well, it started to move off in a slow motion, real slow, right over the pine tree. So I got over to the edge of the door and watched it till it went plumb out of sight. And as it got out, out of the way, more in the dark, I would say, it seemed to me a dome shape of some sort. You couldn't tell. It reminded me sort of, you see those pickups, campers with a little dome on top of it so the light can get inside of it? Well, that's what it looked like. It looked like the light was sort of reflected from the inside. Another man by the name of Evan claimed he saw a similar object pass over his farm in the county adjacent to Jackson County where Pascagoula is. According to him, this occurred the night before the Pascagoula encounter. 
He also claimed that Charlie and Calvin were treated poorly by the press and by others because they stereotyped them as a bunch of illiterate country bumpkins, but that lots of people had seen UFOs around that same time throughout Southern Mississippi. This next eyewitness is a U.S. Navy man by the name of Mike Cataldo and his crewmates Ted Peralta and Mac Hanna. They were driving along the U.S. 90 headed to Ocean Springs when they claimed they saw, quote, a very strange object in the horizon going from northeast across Highway 90. It was going pretty fast. It went down into a wood area and into the marsh. It hovered over the tree line for maybe a minute. We actually pulled off the road and watched it. We said, my God, what is that? Cataldo described it as looking like a large tambourine with lights flashing on it. As quickly as we saw it, it, it just vanished, he said. Being in the military, he felt obligated to tell Navy officials. To his surprise, his executive officer and other crew members just thought they were lunatics. He even called Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi and left his phone number for them to call back, but they never did. This was on the exact night of the alleged abduction of Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker. So we know that the Air Force Base was called at least twice that night. Following month on November 9th, Calvin and Waynette's wedding day, coincidentally, a group of fishermen on the Pearl River saw a strange glowing object beneath the waters. They tried to hit the object with their oars, but the thing would move out of the way, never being hit. The Coast Guard was con contacted and they actually came out to investigate. The two Coast Guards described the object as having an amber light that was approximately four to six feet in diameter and was attached to a metallic object moving at four to six knots. The object would cease its illuminations, change course, and then light up again. They observed this for 20 minutes before returning to the base at 10.30 p.m. No one could explain what it was. In the report that was given to the Navy, it was described as, quote, almost too bright to look right at. That and the color kind of take away from the possibility of it being some kind of bioluminescence. In the report, they also say that they were barely able to touch it, but that it felt metallic to the touch. They go on to describe it as elliptical in shape and that no one had seen anything like the object. Quote, Phenomena observed were not consistent with any known fish or other marine life, nor with flashlight, lantern, nave aid, or other known light source. So when Charlie was alive, he used to claim to still get visits and even communication from beings from time to time. But I'm not going to lie, like I mentioned before, I think he may have started embellishing his alien encounters since the attention he got with Pascagoula. However, Calvin does have one strange experience that happened to him in 1993. At the time, Calvin was living in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, and decided to take his boat out to Cat Island, which takes about 45 minutes by boat. He dropped anchor about 25 feet away from the shore and was admiring what a beautiful sunny day it was. He brought a sandwich and four bottles of water and plenty of bait for a good day of fishing. He had left at 7 a.m., so plenty of time to get back home before dark. Well, the way he tells it, he was there fishing for what felt like 30 minutes and then he looked up and it was just dark. He thought to himself, what the hell happened? I don't remember anything and now it's dark? He looked down at his watch and it was 11 p.m. His mouth was dry, so he reached for one of his water bottles, but there was none, no sandwich either. He hightailed it back to Bay St. Louis and loads up his boat, and on his windshield he finds a note from poor Waynette, who has been worried sick by this point, and the note says, Where are you? I'm worried. I gotta say, Waynette through this whole story seems like a real one. I'm glad they got back together after they got divorced. And Calvin seems like a real one too. Back at home, he tries to explain to Waynette what happened, to which she simply replied, Well, did you catch some fish? No, I don't think so, said Calvin. Well, his recent experience with missing time and his newfound openness to the UFO world led him to find a man by the name of Bud Hopkins, another hypnotic regression therapist who has worked with numerous so-called abductees. Now, I have some issues with Bud Hopkins, too, but again, that's for another episode. I just am not sure how credible he is, but here's what Calvin had to say during this 1993 regression. But before I do, be advised that it is weird as hell, and it's why I don't really believe in hypnotic regression. And besides, 20 years had passed by now. He begins with describing the night of October 11th, 1973, and tells Bud that they're fishing and yada yada yada. What is added to this story is that Calvin claims he felt sick shortly before he saw the blue lights 
like he just felt not okay or that something bad was going to happen, which is why he was kind of trying to get Charlie to leave, not just because they weren't catching any fish. He said Charlie threw down his pole upon seeing the craft, which for Charlie was like dropping one of his young children. Calvin said he felt cramps all over his body and it started pulling him down and he couldn't move. He said it was some type of noise that was causing this pain and paralyzation, which by the way is extremely common if not almost ubiquitous in abduction cases. He said it was so soft but also so harsh. He said the craft looked about as large as a football field, which seems much larger than what they both had said initially. He goes on to say that at first he's thinking someone is pulling a joke on them, but he soon realizes that they're in a serious situation. He says the beings look like football players, broad shoulders, long arms, but that they didn't have a face. And he said when they touched him, he felt a burning sensation throughout his body, like hot coals. Like the original story, he goes on to say that he and Charlie start floating towards the craft. He says he didn't feel pain anymore and felt relaxed during this. But then again, he feels a tugging on his arm that produces a burning sensation and he starts praying, asking God to just let him die right there, that he can't bear whatever is about to happen. Calvin, the good Christian family guy who doesn't drink or have premarital sex and probably doesn't even cuss, says he wants to tell these beings to, quote, leave him the F alone. But Hopkins, the hypnotist, asks Calvin, quote, did they have your permission to do any of this? To which Calvin replies, no. Bud asks him to further describe what he's feeling. So Calvin says, there's some kind of electrical charge. My feelings are coming back to my body, but I can't move. I can feel everything in there and it's cold. It's really cold and there's electricity. You can just feel it coming through your body, the electrical charges, but it doesn't hurt or anything. Some kind of little ball is dancing around. It's really pretty. It gives me a feeling of peace. Then I'm being told something. He says he was then pulled through some kind of doorway. He said it was like being pulled by a magnet and then that he was strapped down to a table with big black straps around his legs, arms, and stomach and that he was alone. Until there was someone else in there with him. Boy, this bitch is ugly, he says. And I remember seeing a mask. Yeah, she's got a mask on. I can see a mask. She's wearing a mask. Now being able to talk, Calvin asks her, who are you? But this being just stuck her finger in his nose bet you thought i was going somewhere else with that but anyway she sticks his finger or sticks her finger in his nose and he says i don't know what she's got an attitude though she's got a bad attitude just as soon as i get loose i'm gonna twist her head off a real serious attitude on that bitch and by the way i'm reading this from the transcripts okay this is not what i am saying or paraphrasing this is directly from the transcripts but he tells Bud that he's seen her before, that he's seen pictures of her before. He says, I've seen her before and I really hate her. I hate her. Bud asks, when did you see her before? Calvin replies, I had just turned six years old, November 7th. I'm in bed with my brother. I sleep with my brother now because we've got a small house and he's sad about wetting the bed and I usually sleep on the floor, but he had wet the bed and I had got, got up and laid down on the floor with a blanket and I had seen her. Bud asks who she is, and Calvin says, I don't know, but that he knows he knows her, and that he's been knowing her for a long time, and that she's evil, and that he's very afraid of her. Bud asks, do you only see her in that bedroom, or do you see her in other places? No, Calvin responds, lots of other places. On Pearl River, fishing one night with Charlie Hickson, my father, my brother, and I ran out of the wood, I'd seen her. I come running out of the woods and I told them there's a ghost in the woods. No one believed me. They all just laughed about it. And sorry, again, I'm reading from the transcripts and Mississippi dialect, so bear with me. Going back to 1973, on that night, he said this being had a long, thin finger and that it felt like she was trying to insert something, but that her finger didn't go very far. In the transcripts, he goes on to describe this lady or being or whatever uh, taking off his clothes and he goes through these different stages of feeling like really angry and like really violent and he could move around and he could talk to feeling like paralyzed and at ease and like she's providing some type of calming energy. But then he sees this mirror and 
he knows that there's people on the other side of the mirror because he can see them, but he has trouble describing what they look like. But it's around the time that he sees the mirror that he's able to like get up and stand up and walk around. And apparently, according to Calvin, he says that he grabbed this being's head and smashed it against that mirror. And when he did, black goo came out of her ears and he just kept smashing her head against this mirror. And this is why I don't like hypnotic regression stories because they end up just becoming like these weird dreams that people create in their head because you can't rely on like delving into your subconscious and imagination to try to pull out real, true, actual memories. Whenever I guess things settled down after their little altercation, I guess she telepathically communicates to him, you're not going to be a threat to us anymore. So who knows what that means, but then it gets even weirder. So he claims that he, um, that she's showing him like visions of the future and that he's seeing like destruction all around planet earth, that the world is completely changed. He sees them, um, basically possessing human bodies. And for me personally, this is where abductees like lose me is when they start talking about stuff like this. Cause it 99% of the time, these type of things come out of hypnotic regression or just from some rando. And I just, I'm not buying it. But anyway, so Calvin claims that he sees this bright light and he thinks that, you know, he, oh, you know, finally I'm dying and I'm going to be with the Lord, but that he finds himself being pulled back down again. Of course, he's eventually floated out of the ship. He can see Charlie on the pier where they had um, been fishing before this all happened. He describes again feeling paralyzed and not being able to put his arms down. He describes being paranoid that Charlie kept trying to talk to him and ask him questions and he just didn't want to talk anymore. So weirdly, when Charlie did this regression with Bud Hopkins, he didn't want to listen to the recording. He only got the transcripts and the, um, I think he got the actual tape as well, when he decided to write his book in 2018. And after he listened to himself on that tape, he was um, very distressed to say the least. His wife couldn't even get through the transcripts because it upset her so much and they all just went fishing and Calvin seemed pretty upset for a few days, but no one asked him why, because they, they knew it was probably because about aliens. Calvin in his book doesn't recall that he um, actually remembers those things that he said in the regression. So I don't know if he necessarily believes that he even experienced those weird, weird ass stories. The only thing he said is like, he does remember going into the woods and seeing something and that everyone was making fun of him, but he can't remember what it looked like. He just described it as a ghost. Um, and then just minor things, like he would wake up and have scratches on him or bruises on him, but he didn't know where they came from. But, but that's super common, especially when you're a little boy. So now Calvin says that he's open to finding out all he can so he can help others who have experienced the same type of phenomenon. He knows how much ridicule self-proclaimed abductees can experience and wants to be someone people can confide in when it comes to that sort of thing. Having written the book and gotten his story out there, he feels like a weight he has been carrying around for so long is finally gone. And now at that very spot off Highway 90 on the Pascagoula River, a plaque with his name and Charles' name on it stands proudly. I know I've been somewhat critical of Charles Hickson in this whole story, but I'd like to leave you with the quote by Calvin. He dedicated his book to Charlie and it reads, quote, Charlie and I unknowingly stepped into a storm wrapped up in a hurricane. The events that unfolded that night would challenge our lives forever. From the second of our close encounter, Charlie's thoughts were for me. He tried to protect me from that moment on. Charles Hickson, a veteran of the Korean War, was a hero in every sense of the word. And one day I'll join him and go fishing with him in heaven, end quote. Calvin also stays in touch with Charlie's children. So I don't even know where to start with dissecting this case, and it's already a longer episode than I thought it would be. I didn't think I would come out of this case believing in it, but I kind of do. I at least believe that Charlie and Calvin did experience something and that they didn't lie to police or to Hynek or to any anyone. They were telling the truth as they really believed it. Except for, I think, I'm still skeptical of Charlie towards 
you know, after the events, when he started claiming he was talking to aliens and having all these abduction stories. I mean, it's interesting that many people who claim to have been abducted also claim to remember maybe even just one odd occurrence they had when they were a kid. For example, Travis Walton, the Arizona lumberjack whose abduction in 1975 is frequently referred to as the most credible close encounter because of the witnesses and the fact that there was an active missing persons case out on him. He also claims, and he just came out with this uh, not too long ago on the Joe Rogan podcast, He claims that one night or early morning when he was a kid, he was sleeping on the floor with some of his other family members and he saw a little gray alien in a black jumpsuit just staring at him until it ran off. Always thinking it was just some kind of dream, he didn't think about it again until after he had his abduction experience. With Calvin Parker, he doesn't remember the things he claimed during his hypnotic regression, so who knows. And this is me just entertaining the crazy idea that maybe alien abductions are real and they do happen in some way and i know that sounds crazy but there's just so many stories about it some of which probably even most of them actually are probably made up or only came out because of hypnotic regression but i don't know man so far there are two cases i kind of believe and one is pascagoula abduction and the other one is the travis walton abduction oh and i almost forgot to mention one of the potential weaknesses in this story. So there apparently was a camera at the spot where Calvin and Charlie were fishing that night, and it would have been able to catch the craft they claimed to see, but that camera was checked and there was nothing at all abnormal on it. I couldn't find if the camera had caught Charlie and Calvin on camera, but this is the 70s, so I'm sure the footage wasn't great anyway, but it should have been able to pick up a large craft for sure. But with that, there is a theory that is popular among many ufologists most notably Jacques Vallée, and this theory suggests that these crafts in many of these abduction stories are interdimensional in nature, and that's why that camera wouldn't have been able to capture it. We're going to get more into interdimensional phenomena a few episodes from this one, but I'm also not Michio Kaku or any type of scientist, so I have a lot of reading to do before I comment on that, and um, you know, interdimensional travel and interdimensional whatever but to me it maybe makes sense or maybe it makes sense that there is just some weird psychological phenomenon that creates this kind of experience for some people who really knows okay i'm gonna leave this episode here for now if you enjoyed it don't forget to leave a review and hit that follow or subscribe button and also let me know what you think about this wild tale Next time, we are talking about sleep paralysis and astral projection, so until then, take care and try not to get abducted by any weird, evil robot aliens.